Let's explore the linear tools in the input toolbar, the walk input method, the vector line input method, and that manual stitch. So first I want to open lines.bmp. That's located in the graphics folder. That is in the designs folder that's loaded with your software. Going to open that up. And this is a great tool for learning how to use those more kind of linear elements. And I want to look right up here to start with the walk input method. And I'm just going to quickly create one on screen and we're going to look at it in 3D. And we should probably make this a little bit of an easier color to see. And if you look at it, it is short of the tie stitches. It is just one stitch right after the other. Very similar to sewing on a traditional sewing machine without any zigzag at all. It's just one stitch right in front of the other. So what do you use it for? So walk stitches I typically use probably most often I use them to get one place to another without trimming. So that's what I would consider a travel stitch. How do I navigate through a design while sewing instead of trimming? And why don't I trim? I have trimmers on my machine. It's actually oftentimes faster to stitch one place rather than trim and then tie, well, tie off, trim, go somewhere else, tie in. If I can just sew over to that spot and start sewing something else, it's gonna be faster, my chances of thread break are less, my chances of mistrim are less, so I'm a big fan of the travel stitch. I will also use them for kind of fine detail. It's, it's nice for that kind of red work or black work kind of look in a lighter kind of stitch. So it's outlines, it's very fine detail, works well for that. Other things that you might tend to use this for are a manual underlay. If I wanna just tack something down really quickly or it's kind of a weird shape or I wanna do multiple pieces and just make sure that it all attaches, I'll just take a walk stitch and I will digitize around those areas. And then lastly, one of the things that I will occasionally use this for is either a, a basting stitch, so just attach whatever to the backing as quickly as possible with a really long stitch that I'm gonna rip out later, or I will occasionally use it for kind of placement stitches. I know that I want something to be placed on top of this here or here or here, sort of like a locator stitch, but a little more sparse. Those are what I tend to use these for. And again, the majority of the time, it's either going to be fine detail for those travel stitches. Okay, so let me delete that real quick. And then let me scroll over and zoom out just a touch so that we can see this. And I let's digitize this in green. Now to start digitizing, I'm going to grab the tool. I'm gonna set up my properties. Right now, I'm just gonna use the defaults that are in there. Those are gonna work fairly well for me. And then I'm going to just start digitizing over these lines. Now to start, I'm always going to start with a left click, which is gonna give me that triangle. And then if I want to come all the way across, I can hold Alt and it will constrain to 15 degree increments, which this happens to fall on. And you'll notice you get that preview, that little line, that's where it's going to be. So if I hold Alt, there we go. And then I left click and that's all I need. For a straight line like this, I just need a point at the start and a point at the end and then I'm going to hit enter to complete the shape. Now I'm digitizing this in 3D, so it's a little bit easier to see. That's not something I normally do. And I even um, thickened up. If you right click on 3D, you can change your thread width. Oftentimes I would not do that. I would leave it at what it's set at because that tends to mimic 40 weight thread fairly well. Um, but I've thickened it up to make it a little bit easier to see on screen. So I did two points, one at the start and one at the end. It does not get any straighter by adding straight points along the path or trying to help it in. It actually makes it harder to edit. And let's see if I can zoom in here and make this happen for you. If you edit in, so right here, I have a stitch that goes from here to here. If I just keep clicking, every time I click, 
I'm inserting a needle penetration. And those are really close together. Really close together. They're a point apart. So this whole thing pretty much happens in the diameter of a needle. That's probably going to be a thread break for me. So that's something I want to avoid. Even though I have my stitch length set to 20, every time I click, I'm going to sink a needle penetration. So I want to put in as few input points as possible because it makes for more even stitching and it makes it a lot easier to edit later. Let me delete those. So I'm going to shift, click and drag around that to select them. And I'm just going to hit delete. And now my stitches all even back out. Okay, so I could do this again. So I'm going to left click, I'm going to hold alt and I'm going to come over, I hit that edge to scroll over. Left click again, hit enter. And that completed that shape. Now, what you'll notice is that when I started, I got this little propeller. And that's the last stitch of the previous element. So this is where I'm starting. Here's the stitch before this. Now let's, let's take a look at how this element is behaving. So it starts here. That's what lo that little green circle is. That's where I started digitizing. It ends where that red X is. That's where I ended. If I turn on retrace, notice that the red X is now back here. So when I turn on retrace, let me go into stitches and I will walk through this. So this gray, bigger gray propeller, see if I can get this on screen. There we go. The bigger gray propeller is the needle penetration. So as I go into the stitches tab, if I press down on the cursor, I'm going to walk through. So there's my tie stitch and then I start and I go all the way forward and then it goes all the way back. So that retrace is really nice because it ends where it began. So if you're doing detail and you need to get back out of it, there's that tie stitch. If you need to get back out of it, you can. Retrace just goes forward and back. Now I could have digitized that. I could have gone click, click, click. But what's nice about having retrace on is that the needle penetrations will all line up perfectly. Okay, so let's do this next one. This time I'm gonna change that property to a bean. I'm going to start here, left click, and I'm gonna come over, left click, and I'm gonna press enter to complete that shape. And this looks, well, very, very similar. The difference with this one, so let's go back to that project view, let's select that bean stitch, and let's go through it. The difference with this one is it's three threads thick. So as I step through, it goes forward, back, forward, forward, back, forward, forward, back, forward. And you could change how many times it does that. So that's that bean stitch. So these tend to be a little bit thicker. You go one thickness, two thickness, and by default, three thicknesses. All right, digitizing them, all pretty much the same. So let's go back, let's grab that walk normal again. And let's do this piece. So this piece has a nice curve in it. Now, when I deal with these curves, I could right click in the middle, split that apart, and then left click here for that transition. I'm going to hold Alt to come straight across. And I'm going to divide this in half as well. If it's a little hard to control, you can divide it up more. And I'm going to left click. And as long as that circular right click input point as long as that curve point happens between two straight points you can exceed 180 degrees but if it really exceeds 180 degrees when you hit enter it will put in additional curve points and notice that it divides it pretty evenly. So in previous videos, we've talked about dividing up the curves yourself. So that's where these hash marks come in. 
this is where I would divide them. It's where if I was tracing it out on paper, I would kind of mark things out to put in my curve points. And if I exceed 180 degrees with my curve points, that's when I get that parabolic shape. Left click to end it. Press enter to complete the element. Okay, so let's go on to this piece. Now, as I'm digitizing, if I see something like this, I'm going to start with a left click. I'm going to hold alt. I could come here and I could digitize around it. Or what I may choose to do is go all the way to the end, hit enter. And then I may choose to wireframe edit that curve back in. That way I know those sides are exactly lined up. So that's what I'm doing here. I left click to add the points where I want them for those sharp transitions. And then here I want that curve. So I'm going to add right click to add that curve point and I drag this down and I could adjust these handles and I could try to make all this line up or since this is a perfect curve, if I hold control as I drag this, it will arc out perfectly. Okay, let's move on to this kind of S shape. And here again, I have those kind of divided out already in the artwork. You can try to kind of split it a little bit less. You could do thirds if you wanted. Depends on how accurate you are. I'm not always that accurate. That's pretty close, but I'm kind of losing my edge over here. So maybe a little bit less. And that one actually lined up. So here I'm transitioning from kind of this curve into this straight. So I'm going to left click to facilitate that transition. Left click again to go into this curve. And here I'm going to go ahead and do this. I divided it into quarters. Um, you could do it in thirds. I'm often not steady enough on the mouse to pull off thirds the way that I can pull off quarters. So I tend to divide in quarters. Once I'm done, I hit enter. Now let's look at this shape. So here we're going back and forth. And again, I try to do this in as few points as possible. I'm going to start with a left click, right, left, because it's a sharp transition. Doesn't even have to be that sharp of a transition. Any transition for me is pretty much going to be a left click. right, left, and I can do the majority of these in sets of three. One, two, three, which is also the start of the next one, two, three. So it's just a left, right, left for most of these. Now we come to one, here's kind of a transition. Here, can I do it in thirds? I don't know why I keep trying. Yes, here, it's subtle, but there's a transition in that curve right here. So I'm going to left click. If I need to smooth it out later, I can. Right, left, right, left because of that change, right, left, and then I'm going to press enter to complete the shape. If I wanted to smooth this out a little more, I could hold shift and click on it and it will change from a straight point to a curve point and then I could adjust those handles but that would lock in kind of that curve being smooth. And then for this last shape, let's go ahead and select a different tool. I'm going to select the vector line tool. This is a level dependent tool. I'm going to slide this up so it's a little bit thicker. But it digitizes exactly the same way. Start with the left click, right, left for that transition. And I might actually change that later to a curve right, left, right, left. Now here I'm going to hold alt 
It's going to constrain that line angle and make this much easier digitizing for me. Now here, this doesn't fit that 15 degrees. So if I'm holding Alt, I can't really hit it. So I will let go of Alt. Left click, left click, right. Here is a change. So left, right. I'm going to continue around this curve. And then here I'm going to line that up and then I'm going to left click so I'm coming in tighter. It's going to be easier if I left click to make that change in kind of severity of curve. And then left. And then you can do thirds, you can do quarters, you can do fifths. I It kind of depends on my mood, what I end up doing. And then once you're done, hit enter to complete. And now you have that lovely linear shape, although it has no stitches and it shows up as a vector line in your vector list. Okay, so the last tool in here is this manual stitch. Now this one, with the walk tool, every time you click, it's going to sync a needle penetration. But in between those input points, it will sync along whatever you have set as your stitch length with a manual stitch. It will not. So those are some really long stitches. And if you try to right click, it's just going to put in straight points because everything you're doing is a needle penetration. You can't curve a stitch between two needle penetrations. It's just not possible. So manual stitches have no curve points. They are only sinking stitches when you click. So they are really manual stitches. Every time you click, it puts in a needle penetration and it only puts in needle penetrations when you click. So those are kind of your linear tools. We talked about what I would use a walk input method for. What do I use the vector for? If you have access to it, it is handy occasionally to put in guides in your own artwork. So if you're digitizing lettering and you're compensating for push and pull, you might do that. Uh, I tend to use them as placeholders or kind of hash marks on curves. I wanna break this up here. I wanna to remember to kind of divide this up there. I'll use them for that. I'll use them for marking up my own artwork. And then what do you do with a manual stitch? Every time I click, it sinks a stitch, and when I don't click, it doesn't. Well, that is a very manual way of digitizing, and it's something I do very infrequently, but occasionally I will use it for really odd details, like um, a highlight in an eye where I want to just very carefully kind of make a little star pattern, or I want to be in control of the short, long, short of some top stitching on the fur of an animal, or blades of grass or something like that. Um, again, very rare that I use it, but occasionally I will use it for that kind of detail. But those are kind of your linear embroidery tools.